All right, welcome back to Learn SDR. I'm Prof. Jason. Last time we talked about pulse shapes that we will actually transmit and the filtering we will do upon reception. And I did that all in simulation. And this time I'm actually going to transmit out of the Pluto SDR and receive it on the RTL SDR and talk about the GNU radio blocks that, that do this processing for us. Okay, so I'm, I will be, again, uncommenting things as I discuss them. So this is very similar to one of the flow graphs that we made last time. So I'm gonna start with my sample rate, one megahertz, my center frequency, 915 megahertz. Again, in the US, that's kind of the center of the, the ISM band. If you're in a lab, I would recommend coordinating to be a few megahertz off of each other. Um, the, a very important thing here is the samples per symbol. So in my demonstration, in my simulation, I did 10 samples per symbol just because that made some of the math work out to be easy. But normally you choose a power of two for the number of samples per symbol. And normally it's something like four or maybe even two. But again, for illustration purposes, I'll oversample by quite a bit. So I'm gonna have 16 samples per symbol. All right, so what, I'm gonna, what am I gonna do here? I'm gonna start with some random data. So I have random zeros and ones. And I'm going to pack those into bytes. So this is something that, that we haven't done yet, but this next block that actually does the, the filtering and the constellation lookup uh, needs, needs the data packed in this way. So let me just explain what's going on there. So when new radio spits out those random numbers, it's a byte that is made up of eight bits. So maybe it spits out a zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then it spits out a one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then it spits out another one. This is sort of a very inefficient way of dealing with this data. And if you were transmitting a file, for example, this isn't a form that you would get. You wouldn't get one bit at a time. You would get what are called packed bytes. So you can choose how many bits to take off the end. And for binary phase shift keying, we're gonna transmit one, one bit at a time. So that's why I've chose numbers between, uh, that were either zero or one. And imagine taking eight of these and packing them into a byte. So let me just make up the rest of these. So maybe another one and then some zeros and one. Um, you pack this into a byte and the order matters. So uh, there's an option to, to pack them in the order of most significant bit first or least significant bit first. And if we do most significant bit first, uh, the byte that we get out is gonna be 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. So this is packing this unpacked data into a single byte. And that is what the, the next block uses. So the next block is a constellation mod modulator. And this actually does a couple things, all of which we've seen before. So the first thing it does is it actually unpacks the bytes. And then what it does is it looks up the, uh, looks up the value in the constellation. So we're using, so in order to use this block, let me just open it up and look at the properties for a second. We need to specify a constellation. So I've given the variable name constellation. And I'll show you what that is in a second. Um, differential encoding, I think it might be on by default. I, I'm turning it off. This just means don't, don't do anything with the incoming bits. Um, samples per symbol is just gonna be 16 for us. Alpha is gonna be a parameter I'm gonna set. We're gonna start with 0.5 and then verbose and I, just all the rest of the defaults are just off. So this constellation is what we talked about last time. It's a mapping between incoming data and complex numbers. And the constellation object I've made here, I've called it constellation, and you can choose between a selection here. So binary phase shift keying, quadrature phase shift keying, eight way phase shift keying, 16 way quadrature amplitude modulation. I think the easiest thing to see is just this variable constellation where you can literally type in, okay, what what's gonna come in is zero, one, three, or two. And what's gonna come out is this list. So this is sort of what we did last time. If I get a zero coming in, I'm gonna spit out the complex number minus one, minus one J. 
So this is in the, the bottom left corner. And if I get the complex number three, or sorry, if I get an incoming number three, I'm going to spit out positive real and positive imaginary part. Uh, and then you could set various properties so it can do more math efficiently. This, this is uh, a form of QPSK that we talked about last time. Um, I think if you actually choose QPSK, there might be some different order and some different mapping uh, that is annoying and frustrating. But you could, if you wanted to be sure, absolutely sure what the mapping was, you could just type it in like we did last time. I'm just going to choose binary phase shift keying, where uh, zeros and ones get mapped to plus ones and minus ones. And that is what's going to go here. But uh, as part of the homework, you can choose different things. My alpha variable I can set. I'll, unfortunately, with this, Constellation modulator, I can't make a slider for alpha. Um, it it pre-computes a bunch of things. And so you have to have it set as a variable once and for all. If you have it on a slider, it's not going to do anything. It's just going to take the initial value. Out of here, so, so with my binary phase shift keying, I'm just going to get a bunch of plus ones and minus ones, even though they are complex numbers. It'll just be plus one real as a real number and minus one as a real number. Um, but then filtered by the Root, uh, root raised cosine filter. So it'll, it'll smooth it out in the way that we saw before. And when you smooth it out, sometimes smoothing makes, makes the, the data go a little bit higher or a little bit lower. And if we want to feed it into a Pluto, we have to keep the data between negative 1 and 1. So I actually multiply by 0.4 here in order to keep, uh, keep the data between minus 1 and 1. And I just sort of chose that by looking at for reasonable values of alpha, how do I keep it between minus one and one? All right, so before I actually send it to the Pluto, let me plot what we're doing in time and in frequency as we often do. So let me just play that. Okay, so here, this is for an alpha of 0.5. You can see all the samples that are gonna come out. So the imaginary parts are in red and those are all zero because I'm either transmitting plus one or minus one smoothed by the root raised cosine filter. And the real part has, has this, uh, this sort of smoothed out property. Let me go up to alpha equals 0.99, say. That's a pretty, pretty high, high value of alpha. This is almost uh, uh, you know, this is almost the maximum excess bandwidth. So let me pause this and just look at the waveform that's coming out. So clearly here I'm transmitting a minus one, a plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one. Here I'm doing two plus ones, minus plus, 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 et cetera, et cetera. You can just read the data. If I were to go to a really small alpha where I'm really squeezing the bandwidth down, let me go to point, you know, maybe 10%, not, not to be too crazy extreme. Uh, it's a little, you can sort of still see some transitions here, but it's getting a little bit harder. Oops, the frequency plot has shrunk a little bit. And let me go down, really push it down to maybe 1%. One. And uh, here, it's a, again, it's a little bit hard to tell what's happening in between the bits. You can still sort of vaguely see when you get a 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1, you sort of see it bouncing around here. All right, so let me close this and uh, actually transmit. So I'm going to transmit out of the Pluto. Nothing special here. Uh, I'm going to have a slider for my attenuation, so I can attenuate and see how, how uh, quiet it is. And then I'll receive. So uh, let me turn on my slider for my receiver gain, turn on my RTLSDR receiver, nothing special here that we haven't done already, and let me plot that. All right, so first thing you see is that I'm transmitting my data. My transmit spectrum is pretty contained. My uh, my received data is pretty, pretty small. So I'm gonna have to increase my, my receiver gain a little bit. But we don't see pure real numbers, nor do we see any nice pattern here. So we're gonna to have to do some processing in order to figure out what's going on. And the first thing we're gonna do is we are going to offset this incoming data in frequency. So what I'm not showing, which maybe I, Maybe I should show. Well, all right, let me, let me just describe what we're doing and I'll show the original in the offset. So we've done this before too. Because the, the clocks are not the same, 
I have to multiply by a complex exponential to shift around the frequencies. Let me do that. I'll turn on a signal source that's a complex exponential with a slider. I'll multiply the incoming source by that. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pass this to a block we haven't used yet, which is an automatic gain control block. So all this does is it will scale the incoming signal to be roughly between one and minus one. And that, that's useful for, for future blocks, but it also means I don't have to mess with the, the uh, receiver gain that much. Okay, so let me plot the result of that frequency shifted and automatic gain controlled thing. And also just the two spectra, the spectra directly from the RTLSDR, which I uh, was waiting to see last time and, and the spectrum of this frequency shifted block. Now, uh, because the automatic gain control is almost certainly going to amplify, the spectrum of what's coming out of here is going to be higher than the spectrum directly out of the RTL-SDR source. It'll also be shifted by however much we offset. So let's do that. OK, so you can see the automatic gain control slowly ramping this thing up. Let me give myself some more receiver gain so I, I'm not quite in the, in the noise there. Um, and let me look at the frequency spectrum. So right now I have my, my raw spectrum that I'm receiving and my spectrum of, uh, of stuff after the automatic gain control. What you see is these spectra aren't centered around zero. They're offset because the, the, the timing offsets, uh, the, sorry, the clocks are not synchronized. So what I'm gonna have to do is I'm gonna have to slide my offset slider over and multiply by a complex exponential of ever increasing frequency. And eventually, if I'm pretty close, you can see that when I'm centered around zero here, you start to see some, some very slow modulation. So let me see if I can get, a, get that to be even better. And what you're seeing here is still some frequency difference that is really hard to compensate. But there, that's pretty good. Let me pause it and zoom in, especially zoom into a region where there's a, you know, where these things are pretty similar. So now you see that even though the incoming data is pretty noisy, I see basically what I'm transmitting, some, some zeros, some plus ones and minus ones. Um, what I don't see is, is the bits very well. And that's because I've really squeezed my excess bandwidth to kind of its minimum here. So let me change this. Let me go the opposite direction. Let me make it maximum excess bandwidth and play what's going on here. All right, again, I'll increase my receiver gain. And I'll offset so that the spectra are centered around zero. So now the spectra are wider and they don't quite fall off as quickly. But what that has allowed me to do is once I tune it to be about right again, whoop, there it was. If I pause it, so I'm plotting both the real and the imaginary parts, but often they, they line up depending on where I am. Here you can really start to see this is probably two minus ones, two plus ones, a minus one, a bunch of plus ones, minus one, plus one. So with this frequency offset here, you can start to see, uh, see the data pretty well. And again, the more excess bandwidth I give it, the cleaner this plot looks, the more each bit looks like a little, a little bump rather than some mess that extends uh, a long way in both directions. It looks a lot like what I'm transmitting up here. Okay, so, so finally, what I, what I will need to do is in order to look at this, I'll need to pass it through a second root raised cosine filter with the same parameters as what I put in here. So let me enable that block. And here the parameters are uh, the sample rate and the symbol rate. So this is the rate that I'm transmitting a new piece of data. And that symbol rate is just the sample rate divided by the number of samples per second. Um, I have to pass it that alpha, that excess bandwidth parameter. And again, I have to pass it a number of taps here. So this is just the size of that, of the, the digital filter. So the number of samples it will consider when it's making a digital filter. So often this is some large odd number and 11 times the number of samples per symbol seems to be a pretty popular choice. Uh, so that'll that give me 176 for, for this example. All right, and let me plot that in time and frequency. Oh, sorry, let me plot that in time and also plot the eye diagram. So let me play that. Uh, I'll increase my gain again. 
Let me tune my radio. So next time we'll see how to sort of do this tuning automatically. So I'll try to eliminate any clock offset. There we go. That looks pretty, pretty good. Now let me look at, after I passed it through a, uh, my second root raised cosine filter, let me pause it here. Um, it looks, the data looks even better, right? And this is really what should, should match what's on top. Here you can really tell minus ones and plus ones because I have a, a filter that is matched to my incoming data. And uh, uh, I, get, I get out pr pretty clean negative ones and ones. And if I look at my eye diagrams, there's an eye diagram for the real part, an eye diagram for the imaginary part. Because I'm not quite tuned properly, the, what I'm getting is not all real. But you can see where you're supposed to sample. And let me say that that's even true if I change my excess bandwidth parameters. So let me go down to 0.5. That's kind of a middle of the road number. I have to increase my gain and tune. Maybe I should uh, copy this as a default parameter. About right, copy. Now my eye diagrams, I can actually plot. Let me turn on the, uh, turn on the dots here. So line markers, I'll make some circles. Line markers, uh, circles. All right, so these are the actual samples. And let me see if I can pause it at some point. And you can tell that there is, there is a place, there is a sample, not, not exactly on, on one of the 16 samples, but pretty close to one of the 16 samples where I have maximal separation and this looks like an eye and then all hell breaks loose in between. And then one of these samples is pretty close to the, the, the best sample point uh, when the eye opens again. And let me close this and go to kind of a lower extreme, maybe 0.01. Uh, oh, yeah, let's go all the way to 1%. All right, let's see what that looks like in the eye diagram. I'll increase the gain. I'll paste my tuning. Um, you can sort of see that once I've gone through both root raised cosine filters, I actually see some, some bits that are pretty good. You know, of course, my radios are right next to each other. If I pause here and turn on the, turn on the points, uh, for some strange reason, I cannot turn these on in the, in the flow graph itself. That is a bug. Maybe that will be fixed in future versions. Okay. Again, we see that there are some, some places, and here it's kind of the optimal place to sample these would be right in between these two actual samples. And this is the kind of thing we'll start to talk about next time is, first of all, how do you do this automatic tuning? to get rid of any frequency offset. That's basically gonna to try to center the spectrum around zero. And secondly, how do you, oops, how do you uh, choose the optimum sampling point, which, which will involve some change because the optimal sampling point is clearly gonna drift around as the clocks drift from each other. And will also involve some interpolation because it's very, uh, very rare that the optimal sampling point is gonna going to be right on uh, one of the samples that we happen to get, especially since doing 16 samples per second is pretty extreme. Normally, this is two or four. So we'll, we'll see that. Uh, we'll see both of those things starting next time.